Hello, sports fans, and welcome to this initial episode of the Southeast Beast, weekly podcast covering high school sports in and around Southeast Oklahoma. Today, a very special double episode, the pilot episode of this pod. My name is Skip Copeland. I'm alongside my longtime partner, Chris Chandler. And Chris, man, this is exciting. It is. Howdy, Halito, and welcome. Bienvenidos. So you, you might be asking yourself, okay, who are these guys and why do they get to talk about Broken Bow Savage football? And that's probably a, a really good question. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about Chris and, and you can decide whether you think that he's qualified or not. But I certainly believe that he's one of the most qualified people to actually talk about Broken Bow football. He played uh, for the Savages, in fact. He was uh, an all-district running back for the 1983 uh, state runner-up team under Coach Tom Condick. They had a great season, went to the state championship game. A few years later, he actually uh, got into the production business and and created the Beast of the Southeast video during the 1989 state championship season. Uh, Chris has covered the Savages, I mean, really as a sportscaster first for KLOP TV back in 1990. Chris, you and I, uh, we had a couple of landmarks together there in 1991, being the very first live televised football game of Broken Bow Savage football, and and you and I were in the broadcast booth that night. I do remember that, and that was <laughs> it was terrifying. <laughs> yeah, it kind of was, wasn't it? So you and I teamed up uh, then for promotion video. We were a production house, a studio. We focused in on sports teams, and we created the official uh, highlights videos for a lot of teams in Oklahoma and around southeast Oklahoma, some in Texas as well. Certainly the Broken Bow Savages, Chris, was uh, the producer of several highlights films through the early 90s for the Savages, a couple of teams that went very deep into the playoffs and very, uh, one really exciting triple overtime, uh, another state runner up, unfortunately, but what a fantastic game that uh, 94 team played, right? Yeah, against Woodward, and it, would, it remains, I believe, the longest state championship game in Oklahoma history. It went into triple overtime, and uh, of course, a lot of those guys on that team are fathers of uh, players even players that have already graduated for the Savages, and uh, of course, a couple other ones are a couple other ones are coaches. Most notably, Bruce Williams, I believe, coaches at Perkins Try, and he was the quarterback for that team. He was the quarterback for that team, and and was the offensive coordinator for uh, the years that you and I teamed up to do the Broken Bow Savage radio broadcast. That was from uh, the uh, 2002 season at the onset of the Greg Werner era. That we actually broadcast the full career of the winningest coach. Of Broken Bow High School history, and you and I were the voice there uh, all those years for all those wins and those great teams from 2002 to 2013. That was such a pleasant memory for me, and, and what a wonderful thing to get to be involved with those consecutive district championships and and all of the excitement around those teams. Yeah, it was well documented. Or I, I guess you guys can be the judge of how well it was documented. Yeah. It was it was thoroughly documented by uh, Skip and I. It was just great timing. We just came in at the same time that Warner did, and it was just a fantastic era, one of many fantastic eras for Broken Bow football. Yeah, more recently, Chris actually is, uh, as some of you probably are aware, is doing the, uh, the play-by-play and the commentary he's actually the only guy in the booth doing any talking uh for the broken bow live stream well sometimes there's talking but they're not supposed to be so, yeah. the, <laughs> so the, hopefully i'm the only one you can hear yeah the only one with a microphone anyway <laughs> is chris chandler yeah uh he's produces that particular live stream it has did it uh i think earlier for mccurtain county sports network and now it's actually varsity stream and uh man that's a great Great th- thing for the community. I, I love being able to tune in, Chris, and watch those live streams and listen to you talk about the team. Yeah, one of the greatest things about that live stream is that you, you can watch it on a phone, so you can watch it anywhere you get phone reception. Chris is uh, most has recently written for Vibe Magazine as well, doing some feature writing there. And and uh, one thing you should know about him, he has probably the definitive collection, the definitive collection of Savage Football Roster T-shirts. <laughs> and that's that's saying something. I, you know, we've had the posters as well. Don't forget, you and I collected those uh, calendars, the posters that you put on your wall for years and years. But your dad had them before us. I don't know how many years in a row we had uh, at one point that had the season schedule on it and uh, you know, those things were cool, but those T-shirts are cool as well. You have one on right now, in fact. <laughs> I do. <laughs> and uh, yeah, Robo Idabel, you know, the Little River Rights, the 100th anniversary one for the uh, Little River rivalry. Uh, is it because, Skip, I don't have your encyclopedic 
memory yeah. of all these games. So yeah. I use cheat sheets that are printed and then I just, you know, have to turn around and look in a mirror. Yeah. I wish that memory was what it once was. It's not, <laughs> it's not quite the same as it was in, in my younger days, but uh, you know, but it's, it's good enough, hopefully for, for this podcast anyway. Yeah. Let's talk about Skip's younger days. I mean, you played for Broken Bow from 78 to 80 and you played both quarterback and halfback. Well, actually quarterback, halfback and flanker on offense. Yeah. Yeah. And you were also an all district defensive back back in 1980 and uh, well, the field means, was, the field must have been pretty weak but yeah. <laughs> I, I doubt that yeah. but uh, you also that means that you were under the tutelage of Ishkanadi for three straight years yeah. to my undying envy I you know definitely I was and and then I will say publicly for anybody that cares I love Ishkanadi me too man what a great guy yeah, my favorite coach I, I, I think I mentioned this uh, at Granville and you also had Granville Chandler I love Granville Chandler <laughs> yeah I mentioned this at funeral I said you know that's going to be uh, a lot of people's you know who's your favorite teacher or coach is the yeah. uh, code word you use for a password or a, a question that you use when you change a password online and I said you know the thing about it is everybody Everybody would put Kanadimi, but nobody can spell it correctly, so you really don't have to worry about it. Well, you know, there's a subdivision named Kanadimi <laughs> now, so people are starting to learn how to spell it. But yeah, yeah, no, I had uh, wonderful tutelage. I did. I started with Coach Chandler, who taught me the fundamentals, and then. Uh, you know, Coach K just taught me everything I know about how to address the game and, and particularly how to play defense. Yeah, yeah and just build and confidence. I just love the guy. I only had him yeah. one year, and that's still, you know, my favorite coach from uh, uh, that whole era. And so uh, just a great guy. Uh, you know, let's talk a little more about you, though. You, As you mentioned, we we broadcast the first live football game, live football game for Broken Bow in 1990. You actually worked as a radio commentator before then. I did. I, that was uh, the first season I did football was 1990. I did baseball uh, in the spring of 89 for radio. So that technically was my first, uh, you know, foray into sports casting. And then by 1990, I had landed a gig doing the Savages. Who would think, you know, yeah, you, you just you want to do your favorite team. That's if you're going to do this and why not do something fun? And and of course, you know, if I couldn't if I can't do the if I can't do the Oklahoma Sooners, then I'd, let's do the Broken Bow Savages because and I, listen, let's do the Broken Bow Savages anyway, and and the Oklahoma Sooners if they'll take me on, I'm fine with that. Absolutely, you're yeah. sports and you were the sports editor and co, uh, sports editor and columnist for local newspapers. You were feature writer for Oklahoma Prep Magazine. You spent 12 seasons uh, as the play-by-play voice of the Savages, and you're recognized with back-to-back OAB awards for best broadcast that's the oklahoma association of broadcasters you know that's yeah. a tiny town a broken bow and yeah. so a great broadcast yeah, that was that's quite an honor actually i I'm, I'm very proud of those the you and i won those together by the way so that's not just me folks but uh we were recognized as the best sports casting tandem in rural radio in the state of oklahoma two years in a row so yeah that's a kind of a big deal and also the ability to say rural radio without yeah. you know flubbing yeah. it that's, that's yeah that's, it took took some practice that's a demonstration of your greatness uh <laughs> also i mean you were the pa announcer for broken bow football at memorial stadium for yeah. a season and so i'm uh, sure some folks remember that i'm not i'm not, <laughs> not sure how many but yeah and yeah, yeah i mean and you have helped gather and compile all the statistics uh, for yeah. Savage Football. You converted a lot of old 16 millimeter films yeah. that I guess were found in ancient tombs, you know, yeah, and that's right. digs uh, to video and, uh, you know, went through yearbooks and historical facts and also one of the only people that has played both Madden and Tecmo Bowl. So uh, yeah, those, are, those are our qualifications for that's those who care. I span the years, <laughs> don't I? Yeah. No, you know, it's a, you go through it like that, it makes me sound old. And I'm not sure how much I appreciate those accolades in there, but holy crap. Yeah, man. <laughs> but, but, but enough about us. Yeah, let's no stop. kidding. Enough. But, and, but you know, hopefully, uh, for those, anyone that's listening and has listened to this point, us talking about ourselves, you know, God bless you. That's, <laughs> all, that's all I can say. We do have more to talk about. We've got uh, we got a couple of games. As I mentioned when we opened the episode, this is a double episode. And the, re- on, the reason for that is because, believe it or not, we're two weeks deep into the uh, t- 2022 football season already. The Broken Bow Savages playing week zero and week one games against McAllister and I, and uh, Durant, two 5A teams. We've got a recap of that for you. And and then we've got a preview as well for the upcoming game this uh, Friday night. The Idabel Warriors coming to Memorial Stadium. And Chris, that's always fun. 
It's always fun, and it's going to be played again at Memorial Stadium. This is the kind of – it's Idabel has a brand-new football field, but uh, Maruma won't see it till next year. It is a – I'm uh, sorry, it's an even year, and so in even years, the Warriors play here, and odd years, the game's at Idabel. So we're excited about this podcast. We hope you'll tune in with us each week. And, uh, you know, without further ado, let's get right into this. Let's talk about these uh, last two weeks of the football season and how the Savages have performed. Skip, they, they lost against McAllister. But McAllister's a 5A number one ranked team, uh, went down and beat a top ranked team in Louisiana 35 to 20 on the road at the Independence Bowl. I mean, they, they're the number one ranked team in 5A for a reason, defending state runner ups. And uh, with Eric McCarty, the blue chip running back already signed to play defensive back with Oklahoma, uh, Broken Bow goes up there to their place after, you know, losing by several touchdowns here at Broken Bow last year and gives them all they want. 34 to 24 is your final score, but Broken Bow at one point was three points behind in the fourth quarter there at McAllister. Well, you know, it's a tough way to start if you're the Rod Davis era here in Broken Bow and, uh, you know, a new coaching staff coming in and you've got to face one of the best teams in the state. No question, a number one ranked team in in uh, Class 5A. But the Savages really did go up there and, and uh, make a showing. But overall, when you look at the strength and conditioning of the team and, and how they performed on the field, the physicality of the team, and just some of the young players that have stepped up into roles. Got to be excited about this Savage season. That was a very, very good performance against a really good McAllister team. And I think Rod Davis put a put a fine point on it when he said that the players got back. You know, one of the most important things is they knew they should have won the game. And what does that say? It's like, yeah, it's it's a little bit of a regret, but they should have beat the number one team in Class 5A, that says a lot about how much confidence they have and, and that self-realization that, hey, we're a pretty good football team. We can go a long way this year. Yeah, I would think anytime you're an athlete and you, uh, you know, recognize that your performance is a little better than maybe what the expectation was, it's always exciting. And it's especially if you're a young player, you're getting a chance to play, and then all of a sudden you see – Hey, I can play with these guys. The game is faster, yes, but so am I. Uh, and I think that was a realization. I do. I think it was a real epiphany for the team. And and uh, you look at just you look at both sides of the football for Broken Bow, and there's a lot of things there that they do right. Uh, those linebackers and the front three on defense, really that seven total unit up front is doing a great job of uh, handling the line of scrimmage, turning the rushing game down, doing some open field tackling. I mean, they really are playing well. And you talk about that linebacking core. Christian Brumley, of course, he's a known value. I mean, he has been starting since a sophomore. Had 146 tackles as a sophomore, led the team. And so you have him, but instead of in the interior, they've moved him to the outside. He does have speed. I mean, he runs track. He is, uh, you know, he's, he's a guy that can get to you quickly. And it's rather deceptive, his speed, because he takes long strides, but he gets out there quickly, very strong. Jace Roberts also on the outside, just a really solid football player, also can run. But then you have Aiden Coley, who did start last year, but was on the line. And man, what a difference it makes. They, they move him back to linebacker. He's filling holes. And then the the newcomer, Quinlan Bailey, number 44, just a sophomore, but just a, a, a hard hitter that just seems to have a nose for the football. Yeah, Bailey's a headhunter. He really is. And he's one of those guys, a prototypical inside linebacker. I mean, you, you want a guy like that. You want him to be aggressive. You want him chasing the, the ball carrier and then punishing him when he gets there. And that's who Bailey seems to be. I mean, for a young guy uh, stepping up, playing the varsity level like this, and particularly in that McAllister game, he really showed himself. I noticed him right away. I was like, who is number 44? He's a player. And you'd look at Bailey, you know, he's just going to get better. He's going to mature physically. I mean, he's a sophomore, you know, you get a couple of, you know, 20 pounds on him, maybe just get a step faster. And he is, he is a, uh, he's a terror for opposing offenses. And then Aiden Cole, you know, you're moving back off the line and that's, you're playing at linebacker now. And he seems to have just thrived there. It's like, man, I can see, I can see the play developed and he has enough you know, enough speed to get over there. So that is a huge threat. Then on the line, you got Zach O'Donnell, who really had a good game. I mean, the guy's, a, you know, he's a two-year starter, but he's uh, there with Leland Billy, and Billy is a newcomer to the Savages. But, man, what a, uh, what a physical specimen he is, and he is super aggressive. He loves contact. He's a load. He really is. I mean, you want to talk about how well those guys are playing on the inside, uh, those two linebackers, uh, Coley and, and uh, Bailey. But man, you got to give some credit to number eighty-eight. Billy's up there taking on a couple of blockers, and 
you know, really tying things up, giving those linebackers a chance to be that active. That's a big credit. But been a while since we've had defensive tackles that were as mobile and active as these two are, O'Donnell and Billy, uh, really playing the game well. Unfortunately, we lost uh, Davis, you know, in the middle of the field there. That's going to be a big loss. I, I mean, uh, Trenton Davis, I believe, uh, has a, a season-ending injury. Is that right, Chris? Uh, most likely, yeah. It, it's a, it's a collarbone, and so, you, you know, it's a, it's a break, and those things take time to heal. And you, you, you regu- certainly regular season, and, and Trenton Davis is a good baseball player, too. You don't want to, you know, jeopardize any – obviously never want to jeopardize his health, but also he's got another season to look forward to in a different sport. But but uh, the Savages look like they may be going, you know, uh, you know into the – have the potential to go – deep into the playoffs and so you may see him back but it's it's highly unlikely unless you're talking that you know semifinals championship type game carter goss came in and filled in fairly well though that's something that uh broken bow has quite a bit of depth or appear to have quite a bit of depth here you know they uh they have the front seven and then they have the uh experience in the secondary these guys all, all four players that i should say five players in the secondary because they do rotate out but you've got uh a couple of cornerbacks in Camden Rogers and uh, Willis who can run. I mean, in fact, do run on the track team on the sprint relay. So are very fast. And then Mark Martin at strong safety, uh, you know, plays mostly run support. But you've got Kyron Whitfield back there at free safety. And uh, we really haven't seen it as much, first of all, because uh, McAllister really throws the ball extremely well. Uh, I mean, their quarterback, Les, now is just, you know, right on target. But uh, when you get guys that will throw the ball up, Kyron Whitfield will go get it, and he can turn that into a pick six real quick. Well, you have to like the athleticism, you know, backs and receivers versus your opponent if you're broken, Bo, uh, because they are so deep. They do have so many good players and, and kids that can rotate in and out and give other teams problems on the field, especially out in open spaces. And uh, that's exciting to watch, and I think this coaching staff's doing a good job of putting those kids in the right position to make Make those kinds of plays. They certainly made those plays at McAllister. Uh, you, we talked about that early start, which was unfortunate for the Savages. They had some pre-snap penalties and they made a few mistakes. They gave up two quick scores and found themselves, you know, in a hole, fifteen to nothing, and then really outplayed the number one ranked Buffaloes the rest of that game. Uh, found their momentum, and then as you said, uh, as Coach Davis alluded to, really found their confidence in that. They came out of that. Uh, loss, but understanding that they outplayed the Buffaloes, particularly in the second half, really should have won the game had they not, if they'd started better. They'd have just started better and kind of kept momentum on their side. Uh, that was a different bet. That was a different football game. And that may be something that you, you know, turns out to pay off in the later part of this season. You, you, you're you looking down the road and you got Poto and Aiden. They're, those teams are similar to uh, Durant, this week's opponent, and to McAllister because. They like to run the ball. And, I, you know, actually, Coach Davis mentioned that about Poto. They like to line up and they're going to run the same kind of flex bone offense or, you know, run right at you and try to use those big linemen just to dominate you. And that's what's happened with Poto, you know, Broken Bow and Bristow the last two years in the playoffs. Is, you know, they've just dominated the line. And I expected to go to McAllister and say, we're going to have to have some outstanding play to beat them with the secondary. And we're going to have to, you know, just kind of get the offense rolling and just try to outscore them because I think they're going to dominate the line. That didn't happen. It was the other way around. Broken Bow did a good job of actually dominating the line against the McAllister Buffaloes at McAllister. Well, they did play a, a good game at McAllister and then found themselves on the road again the very next weekend, you know, at Durant against a, a big 5A team. Again, the physically, these 5A teams, it doesn't really matter where they're at. If even, even if they're a 500-level team, you can count on them having some big boys up front and, and doing some damage in terms of pushing you off the line of scrimmage. Uh, once again, Broken Bow doing a really good job. I thought they corrected some of the mistakes that we saw from the first weekend. Still a few things to uh, work on, certainly. They're a young football team. It's early in the season. Uh, they've still got a few mistakes and that they need to iron out of that, but but really, they were able to establish the line of scrimmage. They were able to uh, slip in a couple of plays that I thought really were effective. I thought the screen plays were especially effective. And then that little zone draw that uh, Camden Rogers saw some real success with against Durant, that's going to be a big play for the Savages as the year progresses. Yeah, Rogers just did running north and south, and that is a difference I've noticed this year. Is most running backs, yeah, you know, depending on your era. Obviously, I, you know, when I played, when you played, and uh, 
we looked at guys like Joe Washington. <laughs> I mean, as, we were kids then, but you look at those guys that are real shifty and a lot of people forever. If you watch any kind of highlights, think, oh, yeah, Barry Sanders, that's what I want to be like. I want to make those moves and make, you know, people lose their shoes. And the Camden Rogers has come to realize that his speed and his big offensive line, the kind of holes that open up for him. His best option is just to run straight ahead north and south, get to full speed by the time he hits a line of scrimmage. And he did that at Duran, and it turned into some really big runs right off the bat. Yeah, I think you pointed out there that he can kind of hide in behind the line, and then he explodes so quickly. Is it full speed? He just runs by you. If you're a linebacker, you don't really understand what's happened, particularly on those delay plays. Uh, I think, you know, looking at uh, the type of quarterback that Christian Brumley is, that run pass option with Rodgers back there, that little delay, and then him, Brumley, making the decision of whether or not to hand it or to throw it to one of his receivers, that's going to give some teams problems because these skill kids can move on the field and, and they're going to be tough to cover. And he did use Rodgers as like a uh, relief valve when he got under pressure, you know, throw it just out to Rodgers in the flat. Rodgers is back there blocking. He's pass blocking. But if, he, you know, he gets past a guy or if he doesn't have a guy to block and there's a guy from another side, Rumley's added a wrinkle. Or I guess that maybe the offensive coordinator, maybe Luke Ring has added a wrinkle. They just throw it out there to Rodgers in the flat. And he turned a couple of those into some big gains. And that is nice to have. Christian Brumley is, as I said, he's very fast. He's elusive. He has a really good read on defenses, but just having that extra safety valve and a guy like Rodgers he can throw to and in turn what might have been a sack or a no gain or an incomplete pass into about a five or ten yard gain has to give him confidence and also give the defenses opposing broken bow just something else to worry about. Well, it gives them reservation as to whether to just bull rush because, you know, that's going to get you beat. If you pin your ears back and go after Christian Brumley and he makes good decisions back there, the broken bow savages are going to get on you quick. And let's talk about good decision because that was something Chris probably did at that Durant game. It just seemed he just seemed to know when to you know when to hold it and when to fold it. In other words, when to try to stay in the pocket, throw downfield. And when he did throw downfield, I mean, hitting receivers right in the hands. The stats don't even show how good it was. Is he had a couple of passes that went in and out of receivers' hands. It wasn't necessarily that they just dropped it because it was bad passes. One of them was literally over a shoulder into a you know receiver that was diving the end zone, but it was a ball that only his receiver could catch, and he hit it right there. Uh, did not throw the ball up for grabs. Did had one interception, but it was it was a toss into the corner of the end zone late in the game, and it was you know one of those ones where I think it was fourth down. It was either third or fourth, and so it was like okay, we're going to throw it up, and you know if it if it gets there, fine. If it doesn't, no problem. It was a, it was as time I believe it was as time as was expiring at halftime. Yeah, I thought uh, both, you know, both styles of passing that we saw from him this weekend against Durant was really exciting, the, especially give credit to where it's due. We had a lot of yards after the catch. So our kids are doing a good job once they catch the football. But on those timing patterns where uh, Brumley needs to place the football in the right place, he really did a good job. He picked out the right receiver. He put the ball right where it needed to be. I thought the offense looked like it was uh, it was clicking on all cylinders. Yeah, and you're also getting it. It's not just Kyron Whitfield. It's not just the playmaker out there. He's getting the ball to Willis. He's getting the ball to Martin. He's throwing it to Rodgers. And so that's going to, in the future, you're going to have to worry about those guys. And as those guys get more accustomed to getting the ball in those passing situations and defense have, defenses have to watch for them, then that's going to wind up with Whitfield actually being even more of a threat because he you can't just double team him. You can't just concentrate on him. You're going to have to watch the entire offense. Yeah, and with <clears throat> excuse me, with Whitfield's size, you know they can move him in. They keep him wide a lot, but uh, I think they can move him in closer, you know, into the slot and and use that delay to freeze the linebackers and get him in that seam. And when he's in the open field, well, that's a, yeah, in the open field, and even when the yeah, first touchdown at McAllister, a little bit underthrown, and Whitfield comes back, goes over the back of the defensive back, tips the ball up to himself, and turns it into a sixty-yard touchdown. Just a tremendous play by a tremendous player. And there's that old adage, you know, big players make big plays and big games. And the, so far this season, I don't think there's been a bigger one than that first touchdown, that sixty-yarder by Kyron Whitfield. Yeah, it's interesting. The Savages are one and one on the season, but you know what? It kind of feels like they're undefeated. That's a weird feeling. It does. It does. It does. It's like you know, and I'm sure the players like you know they don't they don't like that that the fact that it was a loss, but it's not one of those hang your head down 
you know, we got we got stomped and it's like we should have won the game. And that is a great team. And, that you know, they may go on to win the 5A. I hope they do. I hope McAllister wins a 5A state championship. They're certainly the favorites to do that this year. But I also uh, think that there's a good possibility. Uh, you know, you, everything goes right. The Broken Bow Savages could be playing that same weekend. So with two games under their belt, the Savages find themselves at an even 500. One win and one loss. And one more non-conference game on the schedule, but it's a big week for both teams. Well, it's rivalry week. It is the week for Broken Bow and Ida Bell. The Savages and Warriors have been meeting on the football field since 1915 uh, consecutively, and every actually twice a year, starting off in 1921. And at one point, we thought that it was every year. We did some research and uh, it came to find out they, they actually didn't meet in 1943 during World War II. So it wasn't the longest continuous rivalry in Oklahoma State football, but it is certainly um, the most hotly contested and uh, we feel the, the biggest rivalry. It's these two schools, these two towns that are just uh, right across the river from each other that have been uh, going at it uh, for over a century now. Broken Bow leads the uh, overall rivalry, 61 wins to 45 for Ida Bell. There were four ties, uh, and the Savages have won uh, the last five meetings. But uh, you can throw the record books out the window when it comes to Broken Bow Ida Bell. You know, it's, it's cultural, uh, Chris. I think that's the thing that uh, we look at it and we see the connection to community and we look at the county and how it evolved through the years and how these communities came to be. And the schools are certainly tied uh, to the community just in the same way that the churches are. And um, you look at these two schools that have played each other since 1915. And yeah, they, they've been at different sizes from one another. Idabel was bigger than Broken Bow for a while. And then they were about the same size. And now here in the modern era, Broken Bow has been the bigger school of the two of them. And in fact, uh, here very recently has even widened that gap. It's become a much bigger school actually than Ida Bell is. And the series, I think, has paid the price for that here over the last uh, 20 years or so. Yeah, since uh, since 1999, the Savages uh, have won all but two games. Warriors won in 2014 and 2015, and then they ended the uh, longest streak by either team, 14 straight by Broken Bow from 2000 to through 2013, uh, but it was a you know a bit of a close game, a two point game. But Idabel did win it in 2014, and then repeated that in 2015. Uh, it, it the it, the fact that it Brogmo is a larger school now by quite a bit, a 4A school as opposed to Ida, Idabel's now in in 2A. But uh, that 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 hasn't dimmed the um, the the heated rivalry at all. Yeah, I don't think that happens. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think you can. I don't think you can take that out. The, there's an element there that's just inherent to um, you know. Are you Broken Bow or are you Ida Bell when it comes to football? I mean, I think we cooperate and communicate very well in the county with one another, and uh, you know, a lot of things uh, go well beyond any kind of on the field football rivalry. Until you get to the actual football rivalry, and th and then it's kind of the same that it's always been. It's you know we we both want to win very very badly. Yeah, and you mentioned it's part of the culture and it's part of the tradition as well. There's just this big tradition. It's a big thing, and and it is something that's generational. You know, you, you can you know tell your kids and your grandkids about. Yeah, I remember when we played out. Well, it was it was a big week then. We did you know there are certain traditions that have luckily uh, kind of fallen by the wayside, like you know, going and egging. And that at one point, I I, I think I remember a, a story about some Idabel students that had painted the stadium red, and that was when Rector Johnson was principal, or maybe it was the other way around. It was broken by students that had painted some gold paint on the Idaho Stadium, but they had to come over and apologize and and, and uh, repaint it. Yeah. <laughs> but but that's the kind of thing that uh, goes back generation after generation. And, you know, you, it, it's interesting. They started out uh, not even as the Savages and Warriors. They started out as the Broken Bow Scouts and the Idaho Wildcats. You look at some of those old newspaper articles from the 20s, and it's the uh, Scouts take on Wildcats. But there there are uh, the intensity rivalry was obvious back then you know they had like fist fights in the parking lot uh, and there wasn't really a parking lot they just at one point they had lined some cars up alongside one of the fields and turned the lights on to provide light because the game was going into uh going past sundown you know i've had so many interesting conversations with 
uh, players of the past about this rivalry and, uh, you know, a lot of talk about how at one point it was a home and home thing during the same season. Uh, in fact, they they uh, split the holidays. They, one would play at Halloween and the other at uh, Thanksgiving against the two teams. The two schools would play each other twice a year. Uh, nowadays, it's more of a early season game and, and coincides with the county fair this week, in fact. And, uh, you know, I think that's even adds a facet to it as well. It makes it, a, a, especially since the schools are different sizes now, not in the same district, not even in the same classification anymore. So it, it kind of ties it all into kind of this healthy county rivalry, you know, in in the same week as the county fair and, and the whole county kind of gets involved in it now. Yeah, and it's been, you know, the, the good news for Rod Davis is is this has been a good game for Broken Bow coaches in their first year as far as, uh, you know, coming out with a win. They and the new coaches, that's kind of, at one point, it was the first game of the season. Uh, most notably, I mean, I mean, Tom Condick in 1983, Ida Bell heavily favored, Glendale Braxton team, uh, you know, one of the top recruited backs in the state, number one rated Ida Bell a favorite, and uh, the 83 Broken Bow Savage go, went over and won at Ida Bell, and that started off that great season, that great run by Tom Connick, where he went to the state championship that year, got a runner-up, and then went back two years later and won it. Uh, Rich Jones in 88 beat Ida Bell. That was, a, that was a big deal. That was his first year, and that was one of the big games. In fact, started off one and two. <laughs> he started off one and two with a, you know, but did have the victory over Idaho. Of course, the Savages went on to go to the state championship or run ups that year, won it, uh, won the state championship in 89 the next year. And then Ray Hall, his first year in 72, beat Ida Bell. And uh, he did, I guess, what you'd call the, the double. Then when he was a head coach at Ida Bell in 87, his first year at Ida Bell circled the date that they're going to play Broken Bow. And he beat Broken Bow in 87, ending a three or four year savage win streak. So, uh, yeah, it's one of the most attended events in the uh, county. Well, the, the 1989 game uh, at Ida Bell, um, it was. Uh, it's, they were, you know, standing room only all the way around the track, about three deep over there at Ida Bell. And that one featured, uh, of course, that was guys that were playing. Uh, it was a Ray Hall coached Ida Bell team, Rich Jones coached Broken Bow team. You have Eric Young as the tailback. And then you have Brian Hamilton, who is, you know, the star running back for Ida Bell. And uh, a lot of mutual respect there going, you know, your families. And then you'll add this year, you'll actually have uh Oh, the point about that was that the crowd was estimated at 5,000 people. Uh, when you compare apples to apples there, I, I got to think Broken Bow and Ida Bills had crowds bigger than the Oachita ever had. Yeah, and I think I, it, it was estimated at 5,000, and that would be about as many as have uh, attended an event here. I, I really can't think of uh, an, an event, as in other words, a, a spectacle, if you don't count spring break as an event <laughs> now with the tourism. But uh, that that's that's got to be it. Well, strap them on. It's happening this Friday night, so it should be a good one again. But both teams have some talent. The Savages uh, playing pretty well, so good luck to the Warriors. <laughs> so we'll be back next week and let you know how who. Well, I guess who was lucky, who was good, who was bad, and who was ugly. Uh, with a recap of the Broken Bow Ida Bell game, Savages are going to be off next week. It is a bye week, and so we will have a special preview of the district the Savages are competing in, including Ada this year, you know, an old opponent that we have seen throughout the years. So the Ada Cougars back as a district opponent for Broken Bow. We'll look at that next week, as well as a retrospective and some uh, a feature we're going to have weekly here on the podcast and look back in Savage history. Yeah, it's going to be, you know, an exciting season. I'm absolutely looking forward to it. And uh, I'm excited about this podcast, the Southeast Beast. Be sure and tune in with us each week this season, folks. And hey, if you'd like to be one of our sponsors, just reach out skipcopeland at gmail.com. You can send me an email at that uh, address, skipcopeland at gmail.com. And I'll be happy to correspond with you about the opportunity that might be in this uh, for both of us, I guess you could say. Yeah. Also, if you have a, if you have a suggestion as to a topic we might want to cover, if you have a special season or a special person from the history of Brugmo Savage football or Savage athletics, it's not just a football broadcast. Of course, we're in football season now, but uh, let us know. 
A lot to be proud of, a lot to be excited about if you're a Broken Bow Savage fan. So be sure and tune back in and share that pride with us right here on the Southeast Beast. It's a single episode next time, so don't plan on being with us quite this long, about half this long, in fact. But uh, we'll get done another breakdown for you coming up next week. So until then, I'm Scoop Copeland. And I'm Chris Chandler. And remember, once a savage, always a savage.